open at um, Isaiah chapter 50. One of the things that a lot of people have when they're growing up is a role model. That is someone that they look to and they think, yes, I want to be just like that person. That's what I want to be. And it could be anyone. It could be someone on the TV. It could be someone who's at the top of their game in sports. It could be someone who's a, a famous scientist. There's all sorts of people who uh, are role models. They are people that we admire, people that we long to be like. And maybe we're aspiring to follow in their footsteps and be just like them. Now, hopefully we've picked up some good role models because in today's world, there's all sorts of people who make terrible role models. Some pop stars, some celebrities, they lead lives which are just disgraceful in many ways and they make bad role models. We want to be people who follow good role models. And as Christians, this is especially important because Christians, we're in many ways, we're just like other people and Christians have role models as well. It may be that we look to great Christian leaders. We have favorite preachers of the past or there's people who are missionaries who have stepped out and done great things for us. And these can be really good role models. But at the same time, we do need to be careful because these people, no matter what they've done for the Lord, no matter how good they've been, they are still just like us in one sense. They are sinners who are saved by grace. And that means sometimes they disappoint us. And in recent years, many Christian leaders have turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. As Christians, we need to remember that there is another person that we can look to as our role model. Someone who doesn't have any skeletons hidden in the closet, someone who never got anything wrong, someone who was perfect, and someone that we're supposed to be becoming more and more like. That role model is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at this passage from Isaiah chapter 50, this next one in the Servant Song series, we have some aspects of our Lord's personality being brought out, which are wonderful things for us to copy. He is here providing us with a really good example of what a role model should be like. So let's turn to this um, passage and look at him and see why we can trust him as a good role model. And trust is the right word because trust is a word that's sort of central to this passage. As we look at the servant here, we see that he is someone who has got an incredible trust for God. And we see this particularly when we think about the context of these verses. In Isaiah 50 verses one to three, we see there that the Lord is looking for, he's calling out for faithful servants, but no one can be found in, in Zion. There's no one there who is faithful. And then in verse four, the servant of the Lord calls out and says that I can be trusted, I am a faithful one. And he talks about how God Almighty has helped him, how God Almighty has given him a well-instructed tongue to sustain the weary. And this is something that he has uh, gradually acquired over time as he is instructed. We then see in verses five to six that the servant obeys the word of the Lord, even when this leads to difficulty, to being beaten, to being disgraced by having his beard pulled out, to being mocked and even being spat upon. He endures all this hard work he endures all this abuse because he trusts that the sovereign Lord will vindicate him. And as we look at this, we see snapshots from the life of our Lord Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. 
So first of all, we gain some insight into the great mystery of how Christ grew from childhood into man. We know that he was fully God and he was fully man. He had two natures. But there's questions that we have about how did his human nature grow? Were aspects of his divine nature set aside for a while? These are the questions that have given the theologians of old a lot of, they've thought about them a lot, they've written many books about them, they've pondered them. There are real mysteries there. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ grew up like an ordinary person. And then if you look in the places like Luke's Gospel, we see him as a 12 year old and he's there, he's in the temple. And after those incidents, we see that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. How this worked, this interaction between Christ's divine nature and his human nature, we don't really understand. But he was made like us in every way, which means he grew in stature and he grew in wisdom. What we do know is that he amazed the people around us. In those days, the ordinary people, they only ever had a basic schooling, while the rich went on to sit at the feet of a rabbi and they would go on and be educated a lot longer than the poor. The poor got a basic education, but then they had to go out and work. And Jesus was born into a very poor and humble and ordinary family. So he didn't have the benefits of sitting at the feet of a rabbi. Yet, when he came to teach, his preaching was so clear, so powerful and insightful. Even as a 12-year-old boy in the temple, he amazed the Pharisees and the Sadducees that he talked to. He had an understanding that they could not fathom. And when he's there teaching the crowds, the religious leaders just could not understand how someone like Jesus from a very ordinary family could be so well informed. And for us today, this reminds us of the importance that we have in getting to grips with God's word. We are blessed in so many ways. We have the Bible in our own language. If any of you have ever looked at Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, you realise what a blessing it is to have the Bible in our own language. Even the letters are different in the original languages. So we are blessed that we can read the Bible. Even the busiest of people um, should be able to make time for reading God's word. Because one thing that's certain, in this life, people always make time for what's really important to them. So reading God's word should be one of those times. We should all be having that time when we read the Bible, when we pray. Believers also have the Holy Spirit within us, which helps us to understand God's word. And it's often the case that a humble, genuine Christian from an ordinary background can have a better grasp of God's word than one of those university theologians and scholars whose heads are full of facts and figures, but whose hearts are hardened against God. So reading God's word is a practice which brings great benefits because as we get to know the Lord better through God's word, so our trust in him and our faith grows. The second thing we see from these opening verses is how um, Christ is equipped for the ministry that he is called to do. He has the right words to sustain the weary. And we think about some of the things that he said. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. There's that call to the person seeking God. The wisdom that he shows to someone who's really well educated, like Nicodemus. And then the care that he has for someone who's at the bottom of society, the Samaritan woman. How he deals with people who come to him seeking healing. And how he had the wisdom to respond in the right way to every situation even when the cleverest people in the country were trying to catch him out in his words, he knew exactly what to say. What to say. And that's helpful for us as well, because today, so many people are aware that something is missing, but they don't know where to look. But if they come to Jesus, 
He has promised to accept all that come to him, and he has the well-instructed tongue that sustains the weary, that restores and heals even today. This morning, if you've never met him, go to him, pray to him, seek him in the Bible. And if you are a Christian, don't let your worries and burdens crush you. Remember, his door is always open, and with him you will find wisdom and help. Thirdly, we see how the servant is able to hear the word of the Lord and is obedient to what God desires, even when this leads to a time of brutal um, being beaten up. Christ's trust and obedience to the Father was absolute and complete. Also, because of this prophecy, plus a few others, it means that he knowingly went to a horrible death. The cross was not a surprise to the Lord Jesus. He talked about it openly with his disciples. And then what came after his death? The resurrection. That great moment of victory when the Lord Jesus rose again. A sign that God keeps his promises, that Christ's work was complete, and it was a vindication of Jesus' innocence. If Jesus had sinned in any way, or if his offering was not acceptable to God, he would have remained in the grave. But he never sinned. He was innocent and his offering was acceptable. So he rose again. So Jesus was being obedient to what God had uh, called him to do, even when it meant that he had to go through times of difficulty. Well, as we think about this and what he endured so that you could be forgiven, what is your response? Hopefully there's an intense gratitude which is quickly followed by a willingness to use your life to serve him, which means being obedient to what he wants us to do. And sometimes this is easy. Sometimes being obedient to our Lord leads us to those green pastures, those pleasant times, wonderful moments where everything seems to be working. But sometimes being obedient to the Lord leads us into situations that are quite uncomfortable. Places where maybe we don't want to go. Times which are difficult. And these are the times that we really do need to trust him. Because we struggle with difficulty. One of the great idols of the Western world is personal comfort. We want to be happy, we want to be secure, we don't want any difficulty in our lives. And in one sense, that's normal. But we seem to expect it. And some people even linked God's blessings to it. So if you're in that place of perfect comfort, then God is blessing you. But if you're in a place of difficulty, then you pray that you try and get to the place of comfort. But sometimes God calls us to go through times of difficulty. We need to remember that we are just passing through this life and there are times when the road is level and flat or even going downhill slightly, easy to walk on. But there are also times when the road is rough and steep. We need to be people who are willing to follow the Lord's will wherever it takes us. And it means that we're also called to be obedient to him, to do the things that he wants us to do. And this is an area where sometimes we struggle as well. I think as believers, we're well versed in uh, God's word and we know what we shouldn't do. And we try and avoid those things. But the area where we really fall, come into difficulties is what they used to call a sin of omission. In the old confessions, they talked about sins of commissions, which were doing things wrong, and then sins of omission. And they're moments where you do not do the right thing. You just walk away instead. And in our society, I think that's an area where it's quite easy for us to walk away from doing the right thing. Maybe because we want a quiet life. Maybe because we're so busy and distracted with other things. Areas where we could be um, guilty of not doing something right. We see it in scripture, don't we? Think about the prophet Jonah. He's a classic example. God told him to go and preach in Nineveh. So he went to the other end of the world, or tried to, until the Lord caught up with him in the storm. 
For us, it might be ignoring that prompting to give up some old persistent sin. There are things in our lives that uh, we know are wrong and we keep on doing them and we keep on kicking ourselves when we do them. We need to get rid of those things. Otherwise, the Lord may take more drastic action with us. It may be that the Lord has called us to step up in a way that is particular and he's gifted us for that. But for some reason, we don't do it. It may be refusing to give to the church financially or refusing to give your time to the church or failing to help people who are in distress. It may be giving into shyness and insecurity so that we don't tell others about our saviour. Sins of omission come in many different forms and as we start thinking about them, then we realise that um, yes, we are all guilty. But praise the Lord, he forgives us of all of our sins if we confess them. He is faithful and just. So that's what we need to be doing when we realise that we've, we haven't been doing the good that we should. We should be asking for forgiveness and seeking to correct that wrong. And as we think about that, we need to remember that Jesus was obedient and went to the pain of the cross for us. So we should be obedient and we should be willing to step out of our comfort zone for him. And we need to learn that we can trust in him just like he trusted in his father. This trust is based upon the servant knowing just who God really is. The servant has the strength, the resolve and trust to be obedient to God Almighty. Because if the holy God is with you, your cause must be right and just because he's only with people who are right and just and nothing can stop him achieving his aims. When God is with you, it means that no matter the difficulty that you are led into, he will carry you through and he will vindicate you. And that's what the servant knows, which is why he's willing to go through this disgrace. He sets his face like flint, a solid rock, and just keeps on going. He keeps on going. And those that do these terrible things to him, they won't last, will they? We have that picture at the end of verse 9 about an old garment that the moths eat up. And we live in an age when things like clothed moss and carpet moss are coming back because we're using more and more natural fibres without horrible chemicals. And more of us are experiencing finding those little holes in your jumpers and your tops which have been nibbled away by the moth caterpillars. Um, a huge problem. Clothes can just get eaten up. And that's what happens to those people who attack the servant. And it's what will happen to those people who attack God's people if they do not come to saving faith. They will just be consumed. So as we think about that, we see the trust that the servant had in that the Almighty God, that the Father would vindicate him and carry him through those difficult and uh, dangerous times. And he went through a lot with his beard being pulled out, probably done by the soldiers as they bullied him, how he was mocked and spat on. And we know that this is just the build-up to the cross. The next servant song, which is in Isaiah 52 and 53, goes into detail about what happens on the cross. So how do we res respond to the love that Christ has for us? Well, we need to be just like him. We have been saved so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. If you look in the book of Romans, you see that's the end point for the Christians, that we become just like Jesus. And it's a slow progress in our, our lives as a, the Holy Spirit works in us to sanctify us, to make us more like Jesus. But we are supposed to be looking at Jesus and seeing him as our role model, what we aspire to be as the person who is doing the things that we should be doing. And that means we need to be willing to do what is right, even when it's difficult. We all need to be walking the path the Lord sets for us, even when it means going through difficulties. And as time goes on and we become more like the Lord Jesus, so we will find that we have the word that sustains the weary, how we are able to hear the Lord's voice, how we are able to grow in our love and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we should be aiming for. 
And it's something that we're not going to fully achieve in this life, but we can make real, real progress. And it's important that we do, because we see that this world divides into two groups of people. A few years ago, um, there was a saying that was going around about the church, which was that we should be in the world, but not like the world. And that's right, we should be in the world, but not like the world. But I think sometimes we may have taken it too far, and we're so in the world that we become like the world. Christians are called to be a distinctive people, holy to the Lord, that's set apart. So there needs to be something which is different about us when compared to the people of the world. And that difference, well, we see the contrast between the two groups being picked out in verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 is very much aimed at believers, well, it's term, who are going through difficult times, um, but who are trusting in the Lord. Then verse 11 is aimed at those who don't believe. So the message to the Lord's people, it's a little bit different to what we usually see. It's unusual because it talks about the people who are walking in darkness. And we need to remember that the parts of the book of Isaiah were given to a faithful remnant who were living in apostate times when the, most of the nation had turned away from the Lord God Almighty and there were just a few left. Does that sound familiar to us? We live in a time where Christianity has been forgotten in this country and there's only a few of us left. And in those times you feel yourself surrounded by darkness and believers can find themselves surrounded by darkness in several ways. Sometimes individually God withdraws the sense of his presence to teach the believer valuable lessons. At other times the felt presence of the Lord can be lost because of sin and repentance is required. At other times there's just so few of us around that the society around us is completely secular and there's no thought or respect for God whatsoever. Believers can find themselves surrounded in darkness and there's that call to fear the Lord and to trust in him. We're called to trust the Lord in the darkness. And there was a time when that sounded like a strange thing to do. But during the COVID pandemic, we really felt it, didn't we? When we were faced with an unseen foe that we just did not understand. And we just felt surrounded by darkness. Well, during that time, a Christian music group called EMU released an album which had a lovely song on it which was called, I Will Trust You In The Darkness. And I thought we'd be able to listen to that at the end of the sermon, just to pick up some encouraging thoughts. As Christians, we should never fear darkness because darkness will be defeated. God Almighty will glorify his son upon his return when every knee will bow before him and he will vindicate the faith that we have clung onto. Even if it means we have to go through being mocked and scorned in this life, sometimes persecuted, we trust in him for today and we invest the time and energy into knowing him better, certain in the knowledge that he will ca carry us through. But then we have the other side of the coin in verse 11. Those people who light fires for themselves, provide themselves with flaming torches. And this is picking up on how someone who doesn't know God, who doesn't believe in God, responds to times of difficulty. Instead of looking to the Lord for light, they try and create their own light. They walk in the light of their own fires. And that's picking up on the idolatry that is there at the heart of every sinner. Instead of looking to the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who gives life, the one who we should look to for our meaning, our sense of happiness and fulfillment, instead of looking to him, they look to other things to carry them through the darkness. And those ideas come in many forms. There's false religions. There's the new age pick and mix ideas. It may be trusting in science and medicine or even refusing to think about your problem and focusing on having a good time instead. Homegrown lights that just cast confusing shadows, taking people further and further away from the truth. People who turn away from God can never expect to be accepted by him. Instead, they will be held to account for their wrongdoing. 
because God is just. He always keeps the law and he makes sure that it's fully applied to everyone. So we need to be making sure that we are in the right place. And as Christians, we need to be making sure that we have got the right role model. So firstly, if you don't know where you are, if you're someone who may be looking to the Lord God Almighty or looking to the world and you're not sure which, make sure that you are on the right road. Trusting in Jesus is the only thing that will save you. Don't rely upon your own ideas, but look to him. Jesus accepts everyone who calls out to him. It will mean apologising for your previous mistakes and the things you know you have done wrong. But don't worry. Jesus came to rescue people who have made mistakes and got things wrong. Even people who have knowingly done things which are bad. Forgiveness is available. It may mean some changes to the way you live your life today, but it is worth it because you will be following Jesus. And in the short term, that can be difficult, but it leads to the best place. And for those of us who have made that step of faith, then we need to keep on trusting him. When life gets hard, when life gets difficult, when things come up, it's so easy for us to start to doubt. Because deep in our minds, we have this feeling that comes from our society, that we should be happy and healthy all the time. That's not what we see in scripture. God's word promises us that there will be days of difficulty. And he promises that he will be with us. He will carry us through and we will be vindicated. So as Christians, we need to be looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, the time that he spent on earth, the good times and the difficult times, and how he responded to situations. And as we look at him, we should be using him as our role model. Amen.